Good morning, everybody. Yes, well, you are here to learn something about mechanical stabilization of fractures and again, a talk about soft tissue. Um, but at the end, I'm definitely sure after practicing trauma care for about 15 years, I know without treating soft tissue well, you won't never be a good trauma surgeon at the end. So I'm sorry, therefore, we go through this again about treatment soft tissue and uh, all the stuffs around it. Of course, all of you know that blood supply is very important. Without blood supply, a fracture won't heal, and you or your patient will lose the race between implant failure and fracture healing. And there's a nice word from Mr. Gathon Girdlestone, uh, uh, an orthopedic from the UK. He said, the bone is a plant, plant with its roots in the soft tissue, and when its vascular connections are damaged, it often requires not techniques of a cabinet maker, but the patient care and understanding of a gardener. That's nicely said. That's good. But this is only half of the truth. For our patients, that's not all. It's only 50%. Of course, in the beginning, and we will hear this later when Brian will talk about open fracture, it's good to have a good coverage of our bone and a good blood supply to have a good fracture healing. But for the function of the, of the leg, of the extremity, a good healing of the muscles and the nerves and the skin is very important as well. So we will talk about, very quickly, about the evaluation of mechanism of injury. Sutan has already mentioned it. We'll talk about the diagnostics of soft tissue trauma, closed soft tissue trauma. We will, you will hear something about the open soft tissue trauma later. And we try to develop a treatment strategy based on our findings. Okay, first of all, fractures are not fractures, and of course the energy and the force that has caused the fracture is not the same, and therefore you might find different types of fractures and different types of soft tissue trauma according to the power and the energy that went into the extremity when the, when the injury happened. Uh, just an example, uh, this is a simple fall from a curb, this is one point, energy and in, in skiing injuries, for example, the power is even five times higher, and this goes up to 1,000 times higher in a severe car crash. And, well, this does not give you all the information, but it is very helpful for you, um, together with all the other information you will get during the first examination, to have an, an imagination of what is going on below your, the skin. Then there is a nice classification. It is not too complicated and it still works very well for the first uh, inspection of the extremity. Um, it was published by Chen and Oestern some 20 years ago, or nearly 30 years ago, and they said, okay, um, if you don't have any kind of significant visual soft tissue trauma, that might be C0. Then you've got a, a situation that is pretty common, you know, see some contusion, some hematoma, but nothing serious, this is classified as C1. In these situations, you might find a kind of fracture like this one that is not too difficult, and the, the mechanism of injury can be a direct injury. Most of the time, it is an indirect injury, just a skiing accident, you know, with a foot in the ski, and the ski doesn't open, and the whole body turns around, and something like this might happen. And then we come to the more difficult situation, situation when the trauma goes directly on the extremity and causes a closed or an open fracture and of course the skin and the soft tissue below um, the skin suffers from this severe trauma and you find in this great C2 situations a deep erosion like this. This is not open but you see the skin is significantly damaged. You might have a con local contusion, tangential trauma and this is important in this situation, when you see uh, a change of the skin, a compartment syndrome may be possible. It's not 100%, but you should be awake. And the fracture situation will be something like this, like Sotan has already mentioned. It's not just a simple spiral fracture. It's already a fracture like this with uh, more fragments in, more, in, in several areas of the diaphysis. And then at the end, of course, uh, always number three is the most worst situation. You can have a situation like this with a severe uh, damage of the skin, that area, with a deep erosion, contamination, and a high, high incidence of compartment syndrome, even in the gluteal muscles. 
And these fractures, of course, they have to be treated like open fracture. Maybe not in the beginning, but you have to evaluate very intensively for a compartment syndrome, and you have to be sure that one day um, the patient has, re has recovered. You have to go in, you have to excise this once you know where there's still a um, perfused area and to treat it like an open fracture. And of course, the fractures you will find below this kind of soft tissue injuries are mostly very, very um, difficult. Okay, that was the inspection. Then we go for vasculars. We've already heard this is one of the most important things just to check out whether the, there's a perfusion. And um, interestingly, physical examination seems to be sufficient for screening of a vascular injury. Once you have a pulse palpable that was shown in several publications, for example, about knee dislocations, where um, uh, the, uh, an internal disruption of the arteria poplita is not too seldom, that in all these papers, once you were able to palpate the pulses after reduction of the, of the dislocated knee, um, the, there was no relevant vascular injury. But of course, you might have a situation where the patient is unstable or you've got a significant swelling, so you have to go for intense uh, further diagnostics that might be a Doppler. And if you still don't, uh, if you're still not able to find the pulse, then you have to go for an angiogram or for an MRI, whatever your uh, radiologist is offering to you to diagnose the injury of the vascular, of the vessels, and you have to treat this very urgently once, after, once the patient is stabilized. Okay, so there's a first question for you coming to the next part that was about the vessels. Let's talk about the muscles. Let's talk about the compartment syndrome. What do you think is um, the standard diagnostic for compartment syndrome? It's just physical examination, we will talk about this later. You think you, pressure monitoring is the only thing that is important in the uh, evaluation of a compartment syndrome, or you think it might be both, depending on the situation. Will we see the results now? Yeah. Okay, that is interesting. I thought it would be more in that area. Well. We go further and then we, we ask us again what uh, might be a, the best way to check out if the patient has a compartment syndrome. First of all, um, it is not too seldom. Compartment syndromes may be developed in the hand, in the forearm, in the upper arm, even in the brain, you know, inter, uh, intracranial pressure, in the abdomen, in the thigh, and most often in the lower leg. In about, according to the literature, about 17% you will find a compartment syndrome around the tibia. And the problem is once you miss the compartment syndrome, once you miss the right moment to, to open up the fascia, you will have very severe uh, problems. Um, and this will, of course, uh, cause a severe functional problem for the patient. Maybe the fracture that was nailed in that situation will heal if they were able to restore perfusion, but you see, this is something that has definitely to be granted. You have to think about this problem all the time. You just look for a fracture. So just going through the patho patho uh, pathophysiology of the compartment syndrome, well, in the beginning, you've got something like a muscle contusion that leads to a release of vasoactive mediators like histamine that causes a dilatation of the vessels, a fluid water into the interstitial room, and edema. Then you might have some hematoma as well. That increases the volume in the closed room. You know, um, there are the several compartments in, in the, uh, around the tibia, for example, made by the fascia and by the bone. And if the pressure is too high, of course, there won't be a good uh, perfusion of that area because the, the, the little arteries are compressed by the pressure in the compartment. And then at the end, you have a hypoperfusion. You have, again, more release of vasoactive substances, and uh, the pressure rises and rises. A kind of vicious circle starts. And it was very quickly. Within three to, to six hours, the muscle will die, and the patient will have a severe problem in that area. So it is very important to pre prevent a situation like this. And first of all, of course, those who said the 50% physical examination is the most important thing, they are right. They are right. Physical examination is very helpful to find out or to check out if there's a, um, a compartment syndrome. You go for some peace. This is easy to remember. Pain, pain with stretch, paresthesia, paresis. Of course, the muscle, uh, the muscle won't work if it's damaged that severely. 
and there's a high pressure, failure and pulses are palpable. Peace. Six, seven, peace. Uh, that is easy to remember. Um, and of course, if you have a problem where the patient is of extreme pain and you have still pulses palpable, they are palpable, palpable because of the pressure in the compartment that's never that high that will compress systolic blood pressure, okay? But you find all these signs, you should go very straightforward to the uh, operation theater to open uh, up the compartments and to release the muscles. But unfortunately, it's not always like this. You might have a patient who is not cooperative, or you might have a patient who is intubated because he has a severe trauma. And then some of the pieces are missing. Then you, well, it might be possible to move a little bit of the leg, and uh, he's intubated, and he's moving his eyes, and he don't likes it. But you don't know if this is really severe pain or not. Um, well, if you're in doubt, you could open up the fascia, but sometimes, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, you don't want to call the consultant in and say, okay, we have to open it up. Or um, you don't want to create an open fracture out of a closed fracture. So it is, sometimes it's really difficult to say, should I operate or not operate? And in these situations, it is helpful to measure the pressure in the compartments. There are different possibilities. Maybe not all of you know this. Um, you can, these are commercially available. Um, but you even go, can on the ICU with a device you need for your arterial pressure monitoring, you can use this needle and to check the pressure in the compartment. And what are your goals? The compression in the compartment, this is more or less um, the data from the literature. There's no 100% value. But it, the pressure in the compartment should not be higher than 30 millimeters. But the more important, the other value is, it is this the critical pressure value. This is the value between the uh, diastolic pressure minus the compartment pressure. Because you might have a situation where the patient is intubated and his blood pressure is a little bit lower. And if the blood pressure is lower, of course, a lower compartment pressure can already cause a hypoperfusion of your compartment. So always check and compare those both value, values. And if this uh, critical pressure is below 30, you should think about opening up the compartment. So. Coming back to the first question, I think physical examination is very important, but in some times it might be helpful for decision making when your physical examination is not uh, possible alone, just uh, use the, the, the possibility of uh, measuring the compartment pressure. And another question, what do you think, when is the highest risk for compartment syndrome to develop? You think it's within the first six hours, within the first day, you think the onset might be a little bit later, or you think within the two days, uh, after two days, the, the risk is, is gone. So just for estimation, maybe you don't know it, but um, I tell you what is, according to the literature, more or less the peak. Yeah? Interestingly, according to most of the authors, the onset is a little bit later, a little bit be delayed, and the highest peak you find the compartment syndrome is always the situation, or most often the situation, the patient is uh, maybe already on your ICU and, uh, or on the ward at about 12 to 36 hours. This is the typical time for the onset of a compartment syndrome. Of course, you're, this is not the time uh, since the patient is in the hospital. Maybe he was transferred and maybe the, the time passed already since the accident, but this is about the time you have to remember. And it, a compartment syndrome can still happen after six days. That's seldom, but you think about it. But if the patient has a complaint, go for compartment pressure monitoring if you're not sure to open it up. Well, the technique is simply straightforward. You have to open all the compartments, not only the skin. <coughs> for example, four compartments in the lower leg. You have to check the muscles for uh, viability. If the muscle is dead, it has to be taken out. You won't recover. Well, maybe you're not sure on the first set, the first beginning, but it will go in at the second, at the, at the revision. And if you find a bad color, a white color, no contractility, a bad consistency, and no capillary bleeding, the muscle has to go. There's no way that it's dead. It will be necrotic, and you won't have a good healing, and you won't be able even to do a good skin grafting. Yeah. Uh, maybe the patient needs some other treatment later on to have a good function, but this muscle has to be taken out. It is only a cause of infection. Okay, so coming to the skin again, just some remarks on, on the skin and your treatment. You might have a simple dislocated ankle fracture like in this situation. The only thing you find this, what do you think? This is a C, a closed 
soft tissue injury, C1, 2, 3, what do you think? C? C2, yeah, exactly, 2. Yeah, you already see um, a contusion that might be a little bit deeper, and it's not just a hematoma. And of course, if you put this patient into a cast, and if you're not able to uh, reduce that fracture, uh, fracture without high pressure from outside, there's a high risk that you open up your cast two days later and there's a deep necrosis. So be aware, check if this is a stable situation, and if the patient can be fixed with the cast easily without high compression in that area. If not, you should consider to use an external fixator. This is, well, it is done very quickly and it is very helpful, and then you can go in later and do the operation. Same with this situation, Sutan has already mentioned it. Um, if you have a complex fracture like this one, you have to have a good planning. You have to be, well, fit. It has not to be done in the night. And the soft tissue has to be fit as well. If you have a situation like this, again, C2, for example, you should not go in from the first beginning because there is a high risk that the whole thing will go on swelling within the, the, the next uh, 36 hours. And if you go in for a, for a, for a big um, operation and you cut everything out and you replace all the fragments, at the end you might not be able to close the skin after the operation. So in these complex fractures, once they are closed, we will hear what we have to do when they are open. You go to, should go for an external fixation with a ligamental taxis, and then you go in later on once the, the soft tissue has recovered, the patient has recovered. This can be done after, even after 10 days, and you do the, the operation. And my last uh, comment I would like to, 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 to give on the, on the ligaments. Of course, I, I cannot repeat all the problems that might be uh, related to a typical head fracture. You know, there's a high risk of meniscal tears and, uh, and uh, cruciate tears. But something that can be missed very easily is in dashboard injury. You look at a fracture like this and you say, okay, that is complicated, but after the course, maybe you've got an idea how to fix this. But always remember that the energy in the dashboard in a car injury might have gone indirectly through the knee into the leg. So after your fixation of the femur or other fractures, always think about the ligaments of the joints. It's not, it's not a problem, it's just thinking about it. Just check it, do the movements just to find out if there is a real relevant injury to the ligaments. And this can be, for example, could be treated conservatively if you find it in the beginning. Okay? So just to remember, of course, you know, it's not only the fracture, it's the soft tissue that has to be evaluated. If you want to be a really good trauma surgeon, not only a carbonet maker, then analyze the damage to the skin, to the vessels, to the muscles, to the nerves, the ligaments, and try to include all this into your treatment plan. Thank you very much for your attendance.